Good morning. That was great, guys. Good to see each and every one of you here this morning. And if you're watching us live on Facebook, good morning to you also as we worship our Lord and Savior here at Canada Baptist Church. Uh, if you're a visitor, never have been here before, there's a visitor, there's a pad on your pew, so please fill that out and put your name and address so we can get connected with you better and just leave that information in your pew or put it in the offering in the box uh, when you leave after the service. We'd love to have that so we can get you connected to our church plus get you connected to Sunday School Small Group. We had 147 in our Sunday School this morning. Three visitors this morning, that's great. But listen to this. We enrolled six new members in our Sunday school this morning. Yeah. Great, great. That is great. So I know a lot of people are still out this holiday weekend, the last big before us. Anyway, there's a big lot of people out. <laughs> <laughs> so we have prayer for them. But, well, um, I have one prayer update that Susan Cox wanted to share with me. Our brother Randy had surgery Friday. It's like a seven hour surgery on his back. But they feel like it was very successful. So I continue to pray for him. He's still in the hospital, but she wanted to let everyone know that his surgery was uh, uh, successful. So I'm just sharing with you that with everyone. And then we helped three families this past week through our benevolence here at church. We helped seven families through our food. And we helped 15 families through our so continue to support the programs that we do locally and, and we share the love of Jesus through our community. So uh, let's just pray and thank the Lord for it. Dear Lord, we thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for the opportunity to come to your house today and to worship together. We ask your blessings upon this service and do I, we will each closer to you and we pray that dear Lord if there's someone that does not have a personal relationship with you today you come into their heart that is our prayer this morning in Jesus name Amen Good morning I'm not Lewis so I won't make you say it twice if it's not loud but Lewis has got the controls on that one. It's good to see you all here this morning. Like I said, we have visitors. We uh, like to you feel welcome. And uh, the next song we're going to do, by the way, Jonathan and Zach, nice job. Thank you. The song's called Chain Breaker. It says if you've been walking the same old road for miles and miles, it said if you've been hearing, hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies, if you're trying to feel the same old holes inside, there's a better life. There is a better life. And that life is through Jesus Christ. So as the song says, if you've got pain, he's the pain taker. If you feel lost, he's the way maker. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking saint. He will leave you of your chains. Shall we all stand together, please? Chain break. Three. You've been walking the same old road for miles and miles. You've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies. If you ever try to feel the same old holes inside, there's a better life. There's a better life. You got. Oh, 
Dale ministry and a job course ministry. This year, they've introduced the Betterman Bible study to teach men to lift, build up, and give, up, give life to others by helping them discover and implement God's design for true masculinity through practical Bible application in a group with like-minded men. In 2023, Jill Body was named as the KBC Missionary of the Year. She serves on the HR Ministries team as a mentor and discipliner to women and young girls. These women come from diverse backgrounds and challenging circumstances. They meet once a week and walk through scripture and Bible studies that teach their identity in Christ and directs them to seek his plan for their lives. Uh, local prayer. Uh, we have down Gloria Harkins, Robin Austin, Karen Gross, and Jennifer Hamilton. Is there any others? Ralph Interim staff and board as they follow Jesus in his direction for the ministry. Um, hope that you raise up the servants to be hands and feet of Jesus, to be the hand and feet of Jesus. 
And I also pray that you provide protection over the ministry as we proclaim the gospel in times of persecution in our current culture. And I say all this in Jesus' holy name. I'm going to ask you to stand with us now as we sing M275, I Surrender All.
And I was like, <laughs> I sing every Wednesday and Sunday, but they said I sang different there. So I did sing older songs there. And uh, just, I guess there's just a side of me that people don't know. I love Southern gospel music. And today I just wanted to play an old Crab Family song that really spoke to me as a kid uh, and through my years. It's called Still Holding On. Uh, and I just hope you, you listen to the words of it.
Well, it's a good day to be in church, right? So glad that you're here to worship with us this morning. I'm going to ask you to take a Bible and open it to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. I don't want to uh, embarrass him, but Andrew, if you'll just uh, wave everybody once again for a second. He's up there in the sound booth. This is Andrew Stanley. You may not have uh, met him before. Uh, a student in our youth ministry and seeking God's uh, will for his life. And today was his first day to come and stand before us to help lead us in our worship meditation. So I'm grateful for his willingness to do that. Xavier, thank you for worshiping with us today. Getting our hearts prepared for hearing the message, and so I'm grateful for that. Uh, the people that come to the first service, there's a couple of other teenage girls that help us with uh, music each Sunday morning, and so I am just overjoyed today to know that these young people are here and serving God with us, and I'm grateful for those who are allowing them to do that, so I really appreciate that. On this Labor Day Sunday, I know that there are going to be pastors all over America that are going to be preaching on the importance of work, and they're probably going to refer to some passages like Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28, which says, anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands. Now, I know I really just kind of messed some of you up because I told you to turn to Exodus chapter 20, and here I am reading out of Ephesians. We're, we're going to go to Exodus in just a minute. Hold your place there. But I just want to kind of get your mind thinking now about some of these verses that talk about our need for working hard. In fact, Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 says, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. These pastors are probably going to mention Proverbs 14, 23. It says, all hard work brings a profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. They might even talk about the virtuous woman that's described in Proverbs 31. She is said to be a woman who sets about her work vigorously. In verse 13, it says she works with eager hands. She's not idle. She's awake and starts her day before the sun even rises. Her lamp doesn't go out at night until she has everybody in her family fed and cared for. These pastors, they might also mention Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 18. It says, through laziness, the rafters sag because of idle hands, the house leaks. Now, some of you ladies, you might want to write that passage of scripture down. Ecclesiastes 10, 18. Through laziness, the rafters sag. Just maybe point that out to your husband whenever you've got that to-do list ready for him. The rafters are sagging. You need to take care of that. Don't let your rafters sag. That might be a new little slogan you can use in your house. Did you know that the book of Proverbs actually has 19 different passages of Scripture that mention the destructive nature of being lazy, or it uses the word a sluggard. Proverbs 26, 15 is just one of those verses. It says, a sluggard buries his hand in the dish. He is too lazy to bring it back to his mouth. In other words, the opportunity is there. But there are some people that, even though they can lay hold of it, they don't have the follow-through to make it happen. And so there are going to be pastors this morning on this Labor Day Sunday that are going to befall the fact that there are people in our culture today who are lazy and who refuse to work. And they would be right. There are people who do not value hard work. However, there is an old adage in the world of public speaking that says, know your audience. Know your audience. And I'm convinced that the majority of you 
work very hard. You stay busy most of the time. You are uh, dedicated and faithful to your job. You are reliable. You're not lazy. And so it seemed to be, in my mind, to be somewhat counterproductive to talk to you about being slothful. Because what I really think we need to talk about is taking a break. What I think we really need to focus on is maybe set aside our work for a time of rest. You see, God wants you to rest, to take a holiday, to take some time to relax. In fact, he thinks it's so important that he even included it in his 10 most important things that you can do to have a really beneficial and successful life. In Exodus chapter 20, we find this list of the 10 things that God deemed as the most important for you to experience the best life possible on earth. You probably know this list as the Ten Commandments. Some of you who are reading the daily devotions with me through the Version Bible app, you know we just looked at the fact that in Hebrew this list is often called the Ten Words or the Ten Sayings of God. And right in the middle of this list, in verse 8, Exodus chapter 20, verse 8, is the fifth saying. It says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Now, out of all ten of these commandments, this is the only one that also has an explanation. It has a rationale with it. Verses 9 through 11 says, six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Now, in verse 8 and in verse 11, we're told that there is one day each week that's holy. Now, this word holy, it, it means to be set apart, to be different from the other days. It is a holy day, a holiday. day. I think it's important that you make that connection. What do we typically do on a holiday? Well, we take time off from work. We try to spend time with our family. We, we do something that we might uh, consider fun or entertaining. We do something that's relaxing. Often we celebrate or we try to remember some important event. So according to God, then, the Sabbath is a weekly holiday that's been set apart from all the other days. It should be distinctively different from the rest of your week. When God created the world, he said he did so in six days. On the seventh day, he rested from his work. And so therefore, one day each week has been set apart. has been consecrated by God as a day of rest. We're told in verse 8 to remember the Sabbath. Now, when somebody tells you to remember a certain day, that's because that day's important to them, right? They might say, you don't need to forget our anniversary. Or, you need to remember my birthday's coming up. Those are important days. And God says, remember the Sabbath. Don't forget it. It's an important day. And what he's really telling us, don't forget to rest. Don't forget to take a break. And the problem is, many of us do forget. Or, or we don't feel like we can rest. So I need you to turn over just a couple of chapters to Exodus chapter 16. I want to show you that this was not an entirely new concept for the Israelites. One month after they left the 
land of Egypt. They found themselves in the desert, and they didn't have any food. And they began to grumble to Moses that they should have stayed in Egypt where they had plenty of food. How, how quickly they forgot that their life was burdened as slaves, but they were saying, we don't have anything to eat. And so God's going to send them this unique type of bread, a wafer, that they refer to as manna. And in Exodus chapter 16, God sends them uh, this bread and shows them how that they're supposed to collect it and eat it. It's a bread from heaven. So let's read Exodus chapter 16. I'm going to start in verse 11. It says, The Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them, at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. That evening quail came and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, What is it? And that phrase, what is it, in Hebrew is manna. That's where that word comes from. It's kind of like that candy bar, whatchamacallit. Okay, so this is manna. What is it? They did not know what it was. Moses said to them, it is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Each one is to gather as much as he needs. Take an over for each person you have in your tent. The Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much, some little. And when they measured it out by the omer, he who gathered much did not have too much. And he who gathered little did not have too little. Each one gathered as much as he needed. Then Moses said to them, No one's to keep any of it until morning. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it until morning. But it was full of maggots and began to smell. So Moses was angry with them. Each morning, everyone gathered as much as he needed, and when the sun grew hot, it melted away. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much, two omers for each person, and the leaders of the community came and reported this to Moses. He said to them, this is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow is to be a day of rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. So bake what you want to bake, boil what you want to boil, save whatever is left, and keep it until morning. So they saved it until morning, as Moses commanded, and it did not stink or get maggots in it. Eat it today, Moses said, because today is a Sabbath to the Lord. You will not find any of it on the ground today. Six days you were to gather, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will not be any. Nevertheless, some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather it, but they found none. Then the Lord said to Moses, How long will you refuse to keep my commands and my instructions? Bear in mind that the Lord has given you the Sabbath. That is why on the sixth day he gives you bread for two days. Everyone's to stay where he is on the seventh day. No one is to go out. So the people rested on the seventh day. So I want you to notice something in verse 29. It says, bear in mind that the Lord has given you the Sabbath. He's saying the Sabbath is for us. And then the last verse that we read, it says, what did the people do? on the Sabbath. They rested. They rested. So this day has been given to us as a day to rest. We need to understand this test, though, from God. What was he trying to teach the Israelites? Well, this entire episode, it, it occurred because they, they weren't sure that God was going to meet their needs. They complained about not having any food, and so God gave them food. But, but they still were uncertain that God would provide for them. They, they tried to gather too much, or they tried to gather it on the holiday. And so God made sure they understood the importance by making their efforts on the Sabbath worthless. So you can go out and work, but it's not going to amount to anything. Let's also not forget, prior to this experience, if you're a slave, how many days a week do you think you're going to work? Seven days a week. How long do you think you're going to work that day? All day long. Do you think it's going to be easy work or hard work? Hard work. And you're working for 
for someone else for their benefit. And so then at the end of that day, every day, they would also then have to go home and try to provide for their own family. They would have to try to grow their own crops. They would have to take care of feeding their children. They would have to do all of these things that were on top of working for someone else. Well, that sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? That sounds a lot like the world that we live in, where we do all of this work, somebody else really gets the benefit, and then we still have to come home and do all of these other things. And God's now saying, I want to give you an opportunity to rest. Trust me. I'll provide for you. I'll meet your needs. Take the time to relax. So I think that's why this day of rest is so important. It's an expression of our faith in the provision of God. When you take the time to relax, you're, you're actually trusting that God's going to meet your needs. People who are always working, who are always stressing, what are they putting their trust in? Their own ability. And the work. And when you take the time to step away from that work, and I, I'm not just talking about our jobs, I'm talking about all of the busyness that we engage in. When you can really take a breath, a, a true, relaxing breath, then you start to really believe, God's got this. I can trust how many of you have ever taken a vacation and it took you two to three days before you ever really got to that point of where you could relax? Because your mind was still working on all those things that needed to be done. I think that's why we need this regular weekly holiday. It's to routinely set everything else aside, enjoy life, enjoy the relationships that we have with other people. To enjoy time with our friends, to enjoy God's creation, to enjoy God. While you're in the book of Exodus, turn over to chapter 31 with me for just a moment. Exodus chapter 31. By taking a Shabbat, that's the Jewish way of saying the Sabbath, you are engaging in an act of worship in which you acknowledge the authority and the blessings of God on your life. Let's not forget, this is a command. It's a word from the Lord about the best way to live your life. And when you keep the Sabbath, you are not only honoring God, but you're also acknowledging His authority over your life. Exodus 31, let's read verses 12 through 18. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, You must observe my Sabbath. This will be a sign between me and you for the generations to come, so you may know that I am the Lord who makes you holy. Observe the Sabbath, because it is holy to you. Anyone who desecrates it must be put to death. Whoever does any work on that day must be cut off from his people. For six days work is to be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day must be put to death. The Israelites are to observe the Sabbath, celebrating it from generations to come as a lasting covenant. It will be a sign between me and the Israelites forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he abstained from work and rested. When the Lord finished speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him the two tablets of the testimony, the tablets of stone inscribed by the finger of God. Those are some pretty serious Consequences for not keeping the Sabbath. But it, it's a defining way, an outward way, that the people were displaying their trust and obedience to God. It was different from the way everybody else in the world lived. And I would say that's true in our culture as well. Everybody's always on the go. Even if you take that time off on Saturday and Sunday, what are people doing? They're filling it with all of this other activity so that when they go back on Monday, they're more tired than they were when they left on Friday. It's saying live differently than the rest of the world. Let me just take a moment to clarify which day is supposed to be the Sabbath. Historically, for the Jewish people, that day has been Saturday. And 
By the way, when we were in Israel, everything stops on Saturday. There is nothing open. Nobody goes anywhere. All the preparations were made the day before. And they spent time with family. And they spent time just relaxing. Sometimes in prayer. Sometimes uh, just going out and enjoying nature. They took it as an opportunity to, to rest. And since everybody was doing that collectively, well, it made it kind of easy to rest that day. But here in the West, we have typically observed Sunday as the Sabbath. It's a day that we set aside for worshiping God and minimizing our work. And the rationale has been Jesus rose from the dead on the first day of the week on Sunday. And so we gather in celebration and to remember that day. Remember a holiday. A, a day of remembering the death and resurrection of Jesus. You thought we only did that on Easter. No, we're supposed to do it every week. It's every week that we honor God. And yet I, I really think you need to recognize we are doubly blessed. Because our society is built in not just Sunday as a day of rest, but also Saturday as a day of rest. So you have the added benefit now uh, that you can take one day to spend time with your family, relax, and another day in worshiping God. And yet we're still tired. We're still filling it with busyness. I, I realize some of you, I just can't do it. I've got too many things that I need to do. I, I just can't set it all aside. Well, you need to understand that God established the Sabbath for your benefit. So let's turn to the New Testament, Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. There have actually been numerous scientific studies that confirm the benefits of taking regular time to rest your mind and rest your body. In 2005, National Geographic they published a study by the National Institute on Aging, and they had gone all over the globe and they had uh, tried to research these different pockets of people where there were a large number who lived to be over 100 years old. And they found that in those communities, that predominantly everyone observed the Sabbath. They observed the time of rest. There was another study by Loma Linda University, and they found people who keep the Sabbath, they have a better mental and physical health than people who are constantly on the go. And so in Mark chapter 2, Jesus is questioned about the Sabbath. And I want you to see how he responds. This is verses 23 through 28 of Mark chapter 2. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? He answered, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abathar the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. Jesus said the Sabbath was made for us, for our benefit. This is not about just adding another burden to your list. This is about living a life of freedom in which you can actually enjoy it, when you can actually relax and acknowledge all these things come from God. So if you have a job in which you work for somebody else, please don't go to your employer this next week and say, my pastor said I don't have to work. Because that's not what I'm telling you this morning. The Bible is replete with admonitions for us to work hard. As a matter of integrity, we're supposed to work just as hard when their eye is on us as when they're not watching. And yet we're also supposed to show the world that there is more to this life than just the accumulation of stuff and productivity. 
So I want to finish kind of with a, a word of caution. The Apostle Paul, he warns us about judging other people based upon how they observe the Sabbath. And I think it's important for us to kind of look at that. Because it's, it's real easy for us to, to be critical of someone who, who maybe works on Sunday. Or, or critical of somebody. You might even go out this afternoon and you're going to see somebody mowing their yard. You're thinking, they shouldn't be doing that. And I want to make sure that we're handling this in, in a proper way. In Romans chapter 14, Paul says, One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God. And whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. Uh, you remember I said that a public speaker needs to know his audience. And I know that we live in an agricultural community. And, and some of you have truly wrestled with this idea about, do I farm on Sunday? Well, there are times when your cow is literally in the ditch, and you need to get it out. And, and Jesus talks about that. And, and there are times during planting season, during harvest season, when it rains for two weeks straight, and there's only two days that are sunny, and one of them is a Sunday. And now you have to decide, what are you going to do? And, and I just need to say, I, I'm not a farmer. I, my dad farmed until I was about nine years old, and then we, we left the farm. So I never had any of those responsibilities. I don't know what that's like. In the same way, you don't know what my responsibilities are like. I would tell you, even somebody that has the same job as you, you need to be very careful about judging them or, or critiquing them, because you don't know what kind of stress they have on top of it. We need to be careful judging other people's Responsible. I, it is arrogant of us to think that we work harder than somebody else. Or that our time is more valuable than somebody else's. That, that's what happened to Jesus when he was confronted with the situation. He healed a woman on the Sabbath. And there were people that were upset with him. And he just responded by saying, don't you feed your animals on the Sabbath? I think this woman is just as important as your animals. And so, don't create a greater burden on somebody else. If, if they react differently to you about how they're going to take their rest, or how they're going to honor God. You know, in years past, uh, the only way that you could observe the Sabbath was by going to church, eating fried chicken, and taking a nap in your recliner, and that was it. Instead, we need to acknowledge that there is a principle here that needs to be followed. You need rest, and you need to honor God. Do those two things on a regular basis, whether it's on Saturday, or Sunday, or some other day of the week, and you will fulfill this commandment. So how should we respond then? Do we work or do we rest? Well, sometimes that's a difficult decision to make. There are bills that have to be paid, and people are counting on us, and there are deadlines, and there are outside factors, the, the, the weather that I mentioned, unexpected uh, delays, other people's schedules and expectations. Those things can be difficult to navigate. So what we need is wisdom. We need discernment. Several years ago, I was introduced to a chart that I'm going to refer to as the Quadrants of Urgency. It's a, in a book entitled The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. He claims everything that we do, we can fit into one of four quadrants. The first one is things that are urgent and important. The, the second one are things that are important, but they're not urgent. The third quadrant are, are things that are urgent, but not important. And the fourth one is not important, 
not urgent. Somebody observed that Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook, Facebook, he has made millions of dollars because people have spent so much time in quadrant four doing things that are not important and not urgent. In quadrant one, these are things that must be done today. They are urgent and they are important. <coughs> My wife was here for the first service today. And I talked to her afterwards, and she said, I just want you to know, everything on my list for you to do is urgent and important. <laughs> That's how other people feel sometimes, isn't it? Let me give you an example of something that really would be classified as urgent and important. Let's say you're a young mother, and your baby is out of formula then it's going to be urgent and important that you go to the grocery and get formula. That's not something that you can put off. You have to get formula. But then there are other things, things that have deadlines, but they're not really important. Here's, here's a silly little example. Some of you maybe still do this. I know in the past it happened. We had coupons, and those coupons had a date on them. When they expired, you couldn't use them anymore. And maybe you had a bunch of coupons that were about to expire, and you thought, I've got to go to the grocery store today because these coupons are going to expire, when in fact, the things that the coupons were for, you didn't really need. And so there's this idea that it's urgent, but it's not really important. We need to be able to discern that. I, I think, whether we want to admit it or not, we spend a lot of time doing things that aren't really that important. You need to seek balance. And, and by the way, uh, some people's idea of work is actually therapeutic for other people. I, I mentioned that person mowing their yard. There are some people that find that very relaxing. Or, or working in their garden. That, that's a stress reliever for them. So don't judge that person. They went to church this morning and now they're out there mowing their yard. You know what? They, they may be singing praise songs to Jesus while they're mowing. And, and that's therapeutic for them. Paul says, use your own conscience. Honor God. Take time to rest. Work hard. I, I want to finish today in the book of Hebrews. Because the author there writes about a future Sabbath. An eternal rest from our labor and our toil. I've heard in many funeral services a song by Ben Steele. Go rest high on that mountain. Son, your work on earth is done. Go to heaven a shout. Love for the Father and the Son. Well, in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 9 through 11, it says, There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works or from their labor, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. So are you making every effort to enter into heaven? How are you prioritizing your quadrants of urgency? The author of Hebrews says you can enjoy that eternal rest, that everlasting holiday in paradise with Jesus if you will simply put your faith in him as your Lord and Savior. He goes on to say, though, that that faith is evident by being obedient to God. In verse 2, he says, For we also have had the good news proclaimed to us just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value to them, because they did not share the faith of those who obey. And so I just want to encourage you today, make every effort to honor God in every area of your life. Honor Him when you get up in the morning. Honor Him when you go to that at night, honor him with every moment in the show. Would you bow?
remind you that we have uh, new devotion books out for this next quarter. So if you haven't picked one of these up yet, they're here on the communion table after the service. Feel free to come by and pick up one of these. They're also a great little opportunity for you to use these just to give out to other people in our community. It has information inside about our services and uh, a little letter from me uh, to encourage them. So we'd love for you to take the opportunity to take one of these and give them to one of your friends and neighbors and invite them to church with you next Sunday. There's going to be a new Bible study that's going to be happening on biblical citizenship on Sunday evening. It starts September 17th at 6 o'clock here in the sanctuary. We'd love for you to join us and be a part of that. Also, adult Bible study is now on Thursday evenings at 6.30. And so if you're free on Thursday nights to join us for a Bible study, we would love for you to be here. Kids activities start this Wednesday night. And so I'd uh, love for you to see your kids uh, here. I think you can drop them off between 6 and 6.30 uh, in the fellowship hall. That's right. Between 6 and 6.30 in the fellowship hall. And then you'll pick them up in the Christian Life Center. So glad that you could be here to worship with us today. I'm going to introduce you to a family that has been worshiping with us. So pretty good. The Bible study is starting on Tuesdays, too. Yes, there's a, a women's study that happens on Tuesdays, and that's uh, at uh, noon or 1 o'clock? Noon. Okay. Tuesdays at noon, starting this tomorrow, or this, oh, a week Tuesday. Okay, a week Tuesday. Awesome. Frank and Carol Payton are here today to join the Fellowship of Calvary Baptist Church, and so I hope that you will give them a great welcome with a round of applause. Holiday, this man, this person is quite 